much. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I'm delighted delight to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, U.S.-China relations. Uh, and I want to welcome everybody who's out there uh, to this program. So uh, what I'd like to do is do a share screen and um, go to my PowerPoint that There we go. Hopefully uh, we have a screen up for everybody. So uh, this is gonna be about ping pong diplomacy uh, back in 1971, 1972 when President Nixon's historic and path-breaking event uh, 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 to visit China. Um, uh, I'd like, first of all, to give you a sense of where we're gonna go. So I, I've laid out a, an agenda for you. Uh, I'd like to uh, contextualize these events, uh, which were very historic and, of course, very, uh, what, uh, very path-breaking and revolutionary and, and really a major turning point in U.S. history, Chinese history, U.S.-China relations, and even really global history. Um, so we'll talk first a little bit about the ping-pong breakthrough that took place in Nagoya in Japan. Um, and then I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. I was a graduate student in Hong Kong uh, at the time, and I'll provide uh, some additional details on that. And I was a member of the second group that went to China. The first group was the ping pong team, but I was a member of the second uh, scholarly group, the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, who visited China for a month. Uh, we also had the great uh, opportunity to meet and uh, have a four and a half hour conversation with the premier, Zhou Enlai. So we'll talk about that. And I have quite a few slides to show you images of that time period, roughly 50 years ago. Uh, I'd like to spend some time on President Nixon's visit and the role of Henry Kissinger in crafting the Shanghai Communique, which in many ways is a very important document. It lays out the parameters of the US-China relationship. Um, and what I'd like to talk about then is the beneficial outcomes of this event. Um, it's being called into question right now uh, during the Trump era. Uh, and uh, there's, there's an adverse current that sees this, all these events 50 years ago was a big mistake that should never have happened and that should in some ways be expunged. So I'd like to uh, speak against that kind of trend and, and in a way validate uh, the important beneficial consequences of this event of, of um, 50, some 50 years ago. So this is not something that just happened, but, um, but something with really important consequences for today. Uh, now there have been negative headwinds in the US-China relationship since uh, 1989, uh, but in uh, 2019, uh, many uh, prominent American academics, mostly in the China field, uh, wrote a public manifesto uh, saying that China is not our enemy. China is not the enemy. We don't need to demonize China. Uh, we have to deal with China in a very realistic way, but China is not the enemy. So they're trying to tamp down this kind of China as an enemy uh, trend. Um, I'll conclude by talking about the need for U.S.-China cooperation on things that are really existential issues, global warming, nuclear war, things of this sort. So uh, that's the big picture. And then we'll have a Q and A, uh, hopefully for about 25 minutes um, and so on. So let's talk about the context of it. Uh, and the main idea here is at the top of the, uh, the top of the slide, the story really begins with both Mao, Mao Zedong and Richard Nixon, President Nixon, looking to defuse a mutually hostile situation in 1969. Uh, Nixon, of course, had just become president um, and uh, uh, he had inherited the Vietnam War. He had also inherited a very, very uh, difficult situation with uh, China. At that time, it was known as Red China, Communist China, so on and so forth and the possibility of escalation. Uh, now, Mao also was very much worried because in 1968, uh, the Soviet Union had invaded Czechoslovakia and had stationed a million troops on the northern border with China. So uh, Mao uh, was worried about a war, not only 
say from the United States, but also possibly from the Soviet Union, its erstwhile socialist ally. Uh, and so um, this was a, a serious situation. And so I think the main idea here is that both Mao and Nixon began their quest for some kind of rapprochement, some kind of meaningful dialogue and a, and a better future because of their desire to avoid war, uh, either the expansion of war in Vietnam uh, or in China or with Mao, his desire to avoid an invasion uh, by, the, by, this, by the Soviet Union. So uh, they both began this kind of secret diplomacy. Uh, this was not something that was uh, that could be really very public, and so they kept it pretty much secret. They kept it to those to themselves. Uh, very small steps, baby steps. Uh, they went through uh, informal back channels: Pakistan, Romania, uh, Paris, uh, informal uh, agents, and so on. And they also didn't want much of this to be revealed to even the people within their own governments and their own administration. So much of this was very, very, very secretive. Uh, for those of you who want to know more about this, um, Kissinger's memoirs are a good source. You can get those probably in a lot of different libraries. And the um, University of Southern California has a wonderful institute on US-China relations, the US-China Institute which has uh, an enormous number of documents which have been revealed over the last 25 years in this kind of back channel diplomacy, secret diplomacy. Um, let's go back to the original ping pong diplomacy. It occurred as kind of a spur of the moment arrangement. Uh, there were a number of uh, ping pong groups uh, playing ping pong at an international tournament in Nagoya in, in Japan. And uh, two ping pong players, uh, Zhuang Zedong on the left here, who's a champion, he's a, a world champion, uh, not just the nas uh, Chinese national champion, but the world champion, and Glenn Cowan, who uh, uh, was just a, a free spirit. And the two clicked. Uh, so sports brought together these uh, the Chinese and American people through the uh, through the intermediaries of Zhuang Zedong and and, and Glenn Cowan, um, and so uh, what Zhuang Zedong did was to invite the American ping pong team to China, and then he uh, cabled his own uh, what is it uh, his own Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and so they gave it like about uh, some 24 hours and said, yes, let's invite them. Let's go public with these secret things that were going on. Let's reach out to the Americans and see how far this can go. Um, the American media really immediately uh, uh, glommed on to Glenn Cowan. Uh, he became this uh, superstar within China. Uh, and eventually they met with uh, Joe and Lai. Joe and Lai received them, that is Glenn Steenhoven, uh, Graham Steve Steenhoven. Uh, this was in April of 1971. <clears throat> now, this is where my personal life starts to intersect with the history of US-China relations. I was the right place at the right time. And um, I was living in Hong Kong in 1970, 71. Um, I was a graduate student in history at uh, Indiana University. Uh, I become active in the anti-Vietnam War movement in 68. I was at Grant Park and organized a number of teach-ins at Indiana University. I became a member of what was known as CCAS, the Committee of Concerned Asia Scholars. Uh, in 1970, I also married Ann Vanderbeck uh, uh, in San Francisco. And, uh, uh, I'd done well at Indiana, and so I was awarded a Fulbright scholarship. So when I got to Hong Kong in 1970-71, uh, it was really a remarkable time for, for me. I just married uh, a recognized scholar, a budding scholar, as it were. Um, and I do have one personal anecdote to tell you. Uh, I call I was living in, in San Francisco at the time, uh, well, living in Bloomington, Indiana at the time, when I got news that I was awarded a Fulbright to go to Hong Kong to do continue my doctoral studies. So I called my mom and I said, Mom, I've got a Fulbright to go to Hong Kong. And there was a long pause at the other end of the phone. And she waited 10, 15 seconds and said, hmm, isn't Cleveland good enough for you, Yildiz? 
And so I was kind of taken a little bit aback. But there I was, a Cleveland boy uh, in Hong Kong. This is my office space at the University Service Center. It was a place for people who did China studies. And they came from all over, from France, from Japan, uh, mostly from the United States. And this is where I was uh, uh, studying for most of the time in 70, 71. Uh, this was Anne. Uh, we lived with a Chinese family. Uh, and so uh, we got to know them quite well. They also had a little baby. And um, uh, so this is a picture of me with little Anman uh, in our very small apartment in uh, Waterloo Road Hill in Kowloon in 1971. Um, we did write, uh, what, what occurred was a number of us who had been affiliated with various Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars chapters came together to write a document. We felt that with, with the visit of the ping pong team, uh, it would be possible maybe for us to visit China too. And so we put together a two page uh, document that we sent to the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries uh, saying, we'd love to come, we'd like to see the China close up rather than from a distance, rather than in Hong Kong, we wanted to see it. Uh, 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 close up. Uh, we waited for, well, it was about a, a month, and then we received word back that yes, we would be invited for a period of a month. And so, um, so we were just overjoyed. We were just overjoyed. So the, the period of time was really uh, June through uh, July of 1971. Um, we eventually visited about uh, uh, 30 different organizations, uh, I think seven or eight different cities. We started in the south, in Canton, traveled by train uh, in many areas. We went to Shanghai, Hangzhou, Suzhou, uh, Nanjing, Beijing, Xi'an, Yan'an, so on and so forth. So uh, we had a very extensive tour and saw many, many, many uh, organizations and visited many places. This is a picture of our group that was taken I'm right there in the middle, in the back. Uh, that's me. This is the group of Committee of Concerned Asia Scholars. Uh, many of them were ultimately got their PhDs at various universities. Uh, Paul Pickowitz is there in the back. He became a professor of history at uh, uh, UC San Diego. Uh, Judy Bannister uh, became uh, affiliated with the Commerce Department in the US government and did uh, population studies. Some of her work uh, was quite original and uh, determined that about 30 million people died during China's uh, uh, ill-fated Great Leap Forward. A uh, number of other people uh, became prominent in the field. K. Johnson, who uh, became dean at uh, University of New Hampshire, Susan Shirk, who eventually also served in the Clinton administration as a deputy undersecretary of defense, so on and so forth. So there are quite a few, quite a few people. Uh, these are some group photographs of the group with Chinese that we met. Uh, this is at Peking University and so on. Um, general impressions, we were very warmly welcomed. Uh, I think the, Chinese were very much in, eager to give us the red carpet treatment. Uh, and I'll show quite a few photographs of that. Uh, China was very poor um, and it was very obvious in so many different ways. And we'll see photographs of that. Uh, the chief focus, China was very politicized. It was uh, during a phase of the Cultural Revolution known as uh, criticism and uh, transformation and, and so on. So it was, a, it was a very intense period of study. Uh, and uh, the military, the People's Liberation Army was very much in evidence. There had been a lot of factionalism among the Red Guards and uh, in this period, roughly from 66 to 68. So Mao called the army in to kind of tamp things down. And so the army played a really crucial role in all of this. Uh, this was a very typical scene as our bus rolled in. Uh, of course, we had guides. We had two or three guides that accompanied us. And we also had two or three translators 
that uh, would translate for the groups, for the Chinese as we met. Uh, for example, a typical day might be that we in the morning would go to a hospital and see acupuncture used for, uh, you know, for us that was totally novel. Uh, in the afternoon, we might go to a school, uh, maybe a primary school to see what was being taught and how the students reacted. In the evening, we'd usually have some kind of cultural event or there might be free time. Um, our times were pretty carefully, I wouldn't say monitored, but uh, arranged. So uh, we'd have to be at the bus by 8.39. We'd be back usually for lunch at 12. And then we'd have an afternoon program and an evening program. But that also left a lot of time for us. For example, when we got to Sion, we had a couple of hours and we spotted a, a basketball court with a basketball. And we had a pickup basketball game that lasted for about 45 minutes in an hour with local uh, Chinese. Uh, and eventually we found a big crowd just like this one. You can see from the faces, there's a lot of curiosity, but mostly people were very happy to see us, very happy to see us. Um, but they also kept a distance. This is yours truly in Tiananmen Square. Um, and um, under the conditions, uh, foreigners, uh, Chinese were instructed to kind of keep a distance from foreigners. Foreigners were seen as uh, people who could be spies and people who might have ulterior motives. So uh, there wasn't this kind of ultra close camaraderie. Um, and one of my favorite stories happened in the city of Suzhou, which is in the uh, Yangtze uh, area in the central part of China. It's sometimes known as uh, the Venice of of China with many, many canals. This is so a canal in the back in the center part of this. You can see this is, this is a canal and this is a little bridge over the canal. Uh, and as you can see, people were kind of curious. This is just a random photograph of a back street. and also gives you a sense of uh, the lifestyle. So uh, uh, this probably was um, a urinal, uh, a, a bath, bath, you know, bathroom facility and so on. And it was there that I met uh, this young man. Uh, and I'll keep the story short. I can probably tell it much longer, but I'll keep it short. Uh, and he came up to me and he said, uh, are you by any chance a Canadian? And I said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm an American. And he looked at me and he walked away. And I thought, well, that's, and this is all taking place in, 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 uh, in Chinese. Uh, I'd had like three, four years of Chinese and my Chinese was useful. It wasn't as good as it finally got after another year or two in Taiwan, after the visit to, uh, to China to, uh, uh, in 1971. Uh, but I thought, well, you know, I'm not gonna probably see this young man again. Um, well, he came back after about a minute. I was still in the area taking photographs and just being very casual um, and so on. And so he came up to me and looked at me square in the face and said, did you know that the American imperialists are violating China's territorial sovereignty by occupying the island of Taiwan? And I looked at him. First of all, I wasn't sure I'd gotten the translation <laughs> correct. And this is coming from this little fellow. And so he said, uh, well, I, I'd taken note of that position. I'd taken note of that position. So he looked a little perplexed and then went away. And so he sort of confronted me. But then he came back again. He looked me in the face and he said, uh, are you a good man or are you a bad man? <sighs> well, I was really put to the test here. So I said, well, I'm a good man. I've come here to promote friendship between Americans and Chinese. Well, his face really lit up and he immediately grabbed me by the hand and took me to his home, uh, to his house. And so we went off, we were there probably for a good 35, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, his family brewed some tea for me. Then we went off and I said, well, I'd love to take your photograph. And he said, sure but he was not going to have me take the photograph from above. So he jumped on top of these, uh, looks like construction stuff, and said, go ahead. 
And you can see this is the sort of sense of pride and uh, assertiveness that the Chinese were feeling at this time in 1971. And I think it's still there, certainly in 2022. Uh, pride, nationalism, assertiveness, uh, and so on. Let's go quickly through some of these slides uh, that will kind of give you a sense of the flavor of the cities. Uh, the cities were, shall I say, you know, two and three story homes and various areas in Canton. Uh, countryside, very agricultural. As you can see, people carrying loads, heavy loads with these uh, shoulder baskets. Uh, we visited eventually three different communes. All the land had been collectivized, uh, beginning with the Great Leap Forward. And so everybody worked together. And so we went to a, a commune in uh, outside of uh, Canton, uh, one outside also of Shanghai, and then one in uh, Xi'an. So we had a chance to see all these. This is Shanghai, completely different today in 2022, but it hadn't really changed since the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, so this is a view from our, our uh, hotel room, which was in the Peace Hotel. It's called the Peace Hotel, but it used to be uh, the Sassoon Hotel, the Sassoon's Hotel. Uh, which was the poshest hotel in old Shanghai, Shanghai before 1949. This was taken from the window with a long lens. Uh, yes, this is uh, uh, part of the Huangpu River in, um, in Shanghai. Now, of course, it's very different with very up, up to date and modern facilities. And it's a very different kind of environment. So poverty, uh, very, very clear. Um, we visited the homes of farmers outside of Shanghai. This is just outside of Shanghai. So this kind of gives you a sense of the quality of life at that particular time. Um, and here we're interviewing local residents. Um, one of the things that also reminded us of old China, we we're uh, bound feet of this old woman. Of course, foot binding started to go out with the 1880s. It was outlawed in the early 20th century. But there were still many, many uh, women who uh, suffered that fate. Uh, and then, of course, we had a lot of uh, interactions with local farmers. Uh, so it was, you know, we got a chance to really sample uh, China, peasant China. 90% of China um, in 1971 was agricultural, it was, was peasant or, you know, agricultural. Um, a second main observation was politics. This was taken in Tiananmen Square. Um, long live Leninism, long live Mao Zedong thought. Um, uh, the cult of Mao was very evident. This was in a supermarket or a market in Beijing. Um, these are called big character posters. Various organizations would write these public documents and put them on display, put them up. Uh, in Beijing, we also were introduced to a performance by Red Guards. This is a Red Guard who was very proud of her status. Um, we were also <clears throat> shown a, a, a military display of the People's Militia in Nanjing. This is the area um, uh, where in 1937, the great massacre took place. So people are armed. Uh, and uh, this was a a young girl who also had a big gun on her back and could shoot. Uh, in her hand was a little red book, uh, Chairman Mao's Quotations, which was very, which was ubiquitous during the period of the Cultural Revolution. Um, this is a little bit startling. We were startled too. Uh, one afternoon, we were taken to a uh, hospital in Beijing where four operations were performed, four surgical operations were performed. Uh, this one was the removal of an ovarian cyst from uh, a middle-aged woman um, and where acupuncture was used as an anesthetic. Uh, and so uh, she, you know, once she was sewed up, she staggered out of the room. I, I was just with help, but I was astounded. So acupuncture became part of the knowledge base of foreign people. Of course, acupuncture had been around in China for hundreds and thousands of years, but this is the first time that we had a chance to see this close up. 
Our group also was, had arranged meetings with some of China's top leaders. We met with Chen Yongui, uh, the leader of Dajai, which was the model uh, commune located in the northwest part of China. Uh, Chen Yongui eventually uh, became a member of the Central Committee, became one of Mao's favorites. Um, and uh, Wu Guixian, who was a, uh, a textile worker in this textile factory in um, and see on. And so we spent a lot of time with them. We were given a lot of time with them and they were given a lot of time with us. So uh, we spent about a day with uh, Wu Guixian and then uh, almost three days with Chen Yongui. I think they were preparing, they were using our group of young Asian scholars or uh, young China scholars as kind of a focus group. And so they asked us a lot of questions. What's the life like of farmers in America. And we didn't really know very much about that. So they were puzzled. We were scholars and, uh, and so on. The same was with uh, Wu Guixian. You know, what's, what's the life like of uh, industrial workers, factory workers, and women workers in America? So we were, yes, so they turned the tables on us. So they wanted to know more about the United States. So this, we were a window on America. Now, one evening, we were, one day, we were told, please stay in your hotel rooms. Uh, we will be meeting an important person, uh, a leader. We didn't know who that person was, but it was to be with Joe and Lai. Uh, this occurred on July 19th. Uh, we, our bus rolled up to the Great Hall of the People. There was a long red carpet down the hallway. Um, and as we turned left to go into one of the rooms, uh, Joe and Lai was there at the door. Now I was the second person, Kay Johnson, the person that you see next to Joe and Lai was um, the leader of our delegation. And so I prepared some words to say to Joe and Lai in Chinese, but Joe and Lai met us in English. So he said to me, he looked me in the eye and said, how do you do Mr. Cruz? So he had actually spent time looking at our photographs. I don't know how he got them, but he got photographs of us and knew that I was Cruz and knew that she was Kay Johnson. Uh, and he greeted us and then uh, I mumbled something. I was so taken off base that I just started to mumble. And he said, please step over here. We will take a group photograph. And so this is our group photograph. Uh, this is the start. Kay Johnson was our uh, leader for that, for that evening. And so she expressed thanks to uh, the prime minister for the gracious hospitality and everything like that. Uh, and Joe and I, of course, was also very, very gracious. Said, we're happy to welcome you. Uh, so I thought, well, there'd be a lot of pleasantries and so on. So I had no idea what to expect. But Joe and I, uh, and he started by being very realistic. He said, well, I understand from, um, from the guys that have accompanied you that you're very favorable to China. And what you need to do is you need to look at China as a work in progress. You know, uh, that um, there are many, many backward things, things that we've been able to overcome. But even in the successes that we've had, there's a lot of room for improvement. So if you look at our country from the viewpoint as a work of progress, where we've come from, where we are, and where we might be going, doing better, um, and that's, that would be, you know, uh, uh, that would be the way to, to, to approach it. Uh, and he said, if you simply say that everything in China is rosy, uh, it's not true. And if you, and people will not believe you, even if you say that things are wonderful in China, uh, it's not true and no one will believe you. Uh, uh, he also continued, he said, well, you know, all of you are from an organization that is committed to uh, peace and is anti-Vietnam War. Uh, and we can certainly appreciate that. But do your parents, do your parents share those feelings with you? Uh, what do your parents think about the Vietnam War? Uh, we understand that this is a very contested issue in, in the United States. Um, so what about that? Um, and then he continued, we also understand that 
you were very critical of the older generation of China scholars, uh, such as Professor Fairbank of Harvard. Um, and uh, uh, Professor, Har uh, Professor Fairbank uh, uh, suffered greatly during the McCarthy period in, uh, in, in the United States in the 50s. And so uh, you have to understand his viewpoint and ex experience from that perspective. Um, so uh, he was very, uh, so he, he somewhat chastised us for that uh, more than he said, please, if you, when you go back to the, the United States, please uh, welcome him to come to, uh, come to China. Um, and then probably some of the, one of the more perspective, more perceptive comments that he made were, were that uh, uh, we understand that you're from so many different parts of the United States, but there's nobody in your delegation from the South. Uh, the South has become much more important in, uh, in the United States since World War II. So why don't, why don't you have anybody in your delegation from the American South? So when you go back, please introduce us to uh, some of your friends from the American South. Uh, so this was his, uh, uh, this was his uh, what uh, introduction introduction to us. So uh, it was very very realistic. Um, there were a number of other people who were members of the meeting that we had. Uh, one was uh, Zhang Chun Chao, who was a member of the Politburo. This was Yao Wen Yuan, who at that time was the head of the People's Daily, um, and uh, and so on. So uh, four and a half hours, very very friendly. Uh, Joe, and, uh, Joe and Lai was very, probably the most interested that he was, was with uh, Dorothy Kale. Dorothy was a Chinese American from New York City. So he quizzed her greatly about the life of Chinese Americans in New York City. Uh, we also wanted to know what would be, um, what, would, what would be the obstacles to bettering and improving US-China relations, what stood in the way. He said the continuing war in Indochina. Um, uh, he needed to see that US recognition of Taiwan as part of China, Korea was still divided, and the remilitarization of Japan was um, um, an important issue. So after four and a half hours, this is uh, the uh, text of the, uh, has been maintained in the, in the book that our group published. Uh, after we came back from, from China. Uh, after we uh, returned, after we got back to Hong Kong, uh, all of us uh, went back to the United States. Uh, we did uh, four months of lectures, interviews, TV appearances, radio appearances, and so on. Uh, it was exhausting. We were sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee, their Quaker organization. Um, and so this was a... Uh, uh, we also published a book uh, called China Inside the People's Republic, uh, which eventually went through, I believe, four or five printings. We sold 250,000 copies. Uh, yesterday, or today, actually, I went on uh, Amazon, and the book is still available. You can still get copies of it uh, in uh, uh, for uh, 655 and even seven used beginning with it at a dollar ninety nine. Um, unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to skip ahead a little bit because I only have about five or ten minutes left. So let me let me do this. Um, let me. Um, Nixon, of course, visits China in February of 1972. And again, this is the result of a lot of secret diplomacy. Um, and much of this was hammered out with the man at the left with uh, Henry Kissinger. And these were the secret words that I th think really helped to promote this uh, rapprochement. And the cru crucial issue was is the status of Taiwan. Um, and so Kissinger's declaration on Taiwan prompted it. Uh, let's see, Kissinger stated, that as a student of history, one's prediction would have to be that the political evolution is likely to be in the direction which Premier Zhou Enlai indicated to me, that is the restoration of Taiwan to China. So over a long-term period, Taiwan and China would be reunited. 
Uh, and then this would be this Joe saw as some uh, as, as a hopeful conversation. This is from some of the secret papers that are now uh, unclassified and available uh, at the various archives at the uh, University of Southern California and so on. This is the historic photograph of the meeting between Mao and Nixon in Mao's uh, residence next to the Imperial Palace. Um, the crucial uh, language in the Shanghai communique which set the parameters of the relationship that is coming out, the US side declared, the US acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China, that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. So the secret words, Taiwan is a part of China and the United States government does not challenge that position. So it's, it's very convoluted language designed primarily to shield Nixon from a lot of domestic difficulties with his conservative peers um, and so on. But this is the ultimate here. Um, does the US-China relationship, has, this, has it been beneficial? And yes, was the 1972 anniversary still of re relevance? Yes, the rapprochement was a success for both the US and China. And it's necessary to confront this idea that's been developed by Donald Trump and others in his cabinet, uh, Steve Bannon and uh, Mr. Navarro, uh, so on. So they're both, both of them short-term and long-term benefits for both countries. Um, one of the things that the Shanghai communique, and basically the, this, uh, Rapprochement is the fancy word for maybe not quite friendship, but definitely not hostility. It's kind of hopeful uh, outcome for both sides. Creates a peaceful environment. Uh, Nixon basically buries the hatchet and by traveling to Beijing provides de facto recognition of the People's Republic of China as the government of China. And so this really diffused this very, very uh, potentially terribly explosive confrontation between the United States and China. Um, and for China, the focus with now uh, having removed this kind of major threat becomes economic development and trade. Initially, the four modernizations uh, under Zhou Enlai, 1974, 1975, uh, and then under Deng Xiaoping, after 1978-79, when the Communist Party makes that their principal position. Um, and Deng Xiaoping is confident enough to have the size of the Chinese military in 1984. So uh, economics starts to become the primary driver rather than politics. Um, it also put uh, the Soviet Union on notice that uh, China and the United States had um, sort of rearranged affairs. And so uh, it gave the United States a great deal of leverage. And as a result of it, Kissinger was able to go to Moscow and sign the SALT II treaty agreements, uh, which limited, uh, these were strategic arms limitations, uh, which limited the number of nuclear weapons and missiles and so on and so forth. Um, it expanded people to people contacts. Uh, and so in sports, uh, went started to go far beyond uh, ping pong, but also uh, the Chinese men's basketball team plays the USF team. Philadelphia Orchestra goes to China. Bob Hope does a three hour, well, of course, he spends almost two weeks in China preparing a three hour TV special. Uh, education becomes one of the key conduits of person to people to people diplomacy between China and the United States. Uh, and USF in its own way begins to normalize relations with China, it hires the very first person to teach Chinese and Japanese history. That happened to me being me. Again, I was the right place at the right time. So beginning in 77, uh, I've played a role in terms of kind of normalizing that relationship at USF. I've 
My current research topic is on hope in China and the creation of comedy. These are some statistics on the huge number of Chinese students who've come to uh, uh, the United States in 19, uh, 2018, uh, 300, more than 300,000, so on and so forth. Um, the NBA has become a huge hit in China, as well as popular culture in general. Uh, very, very important. Uh, I have been able to spend a lot of time in China, Huadong Shi Foundation, Huadong East China Normal University, meeting a delegation there. And then again in 93, uh, meeting with many friends. Uh, USF has hosted Jiang Zemin in 1993, uh, and so on. Um, how much time do we have left here? I think I may, I may be, uh, let's see. Are we just about done here? Hey, you can go for another five minutes or so, that's fine. All right, let's, let's try another five minutes here and I'll, I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, now the adverse currents probably become most uh, crucial beginning in 2010 when uh, Hillary Clinton, along with uh, Kurt Campbell in the Obama administration, uh, pronounced this pivot to Asia. And in other words, they're going to uh, pivot more of their resources away from the Middle East and from Europe to confront what they see as the possibility of a rising China. Uh, in that 2010, why is 2010 an important date? Because at that time, China becomes the second largest economy in the world. And so they had the resource base to really, in some ways, become what's known as a peer competitor with the, with the, uh, with the United States. So this became uh, a crucial turning point. Donald Trump really uh, tended to exacerbate, fan the flames with his rhetoric on just about everything. Uh, but on China, he says that, uh, uh, China is raping America in terms of the uh, trade surpluses that the Chinese were running. Um, and so this started uh, the, uh, this China threat uh, as, as, a, uh, <clears throat> as an idea in, uh, uh, in, elite China, uh, in elite politics in the United States. Um, the China scholar community uh, got together in 2019 and wrote a, a published a public rebuttal to this kind of trend that China is the enemy. And so the, the idea was China is not the enemy. China is not the enemy. And the person who did the most was uh, Professor Fravel of MIT, but also seconded by Professor Ezra Vogel, uh, the late Ezra Vogel, who was still around in 2019, but was had very important connections in the uh, US academic community. And so more than 100 people, uh, uh, more than 100 scholars signed this open letter, which was published in the Washington Post. We're deeply concerned about the growing deterioration in US relations with China, which we believe do not serve American or global interests. Uh, and they make seven observations. They make seven observations that the current approach of being hostile or negative toward China is counterproductive. This doesn't really serve American interests very well. That uh, the ideas that are expressed in the Trump administration are, are exaggerated. They're not an, China is not an existential threat. Um, the effort to decouple will harm the interests of all nations. Uh, and there's an exaggerated fear of Chinese ambitions and capabilities. The Chinese still have huge areas of poverty, even though they've lifted 800, 850 million, according to the World Bank, out of abject poverty. There's still maybe four to 500 million people who are really earning about $5 a day um, that also need a boost up. So China, while it appears to be, in terms of aggregate numbers, rich and powerful, still has huge problems to really uh, to confront. Uh, one of their admonitions is don't start a new arms race in East Asia. Uh, and uh, China has not really uh, deviated too much from global rules. And you need to encourage China to do more of the same thing. And the best strategy 
is for the U.S. not so much to uh, scapegoat China, but rather to get its own house in order so that it can operate far better. Um, the uh, advocates of decoupling published their statement in the journal Political Risk. Uh, and so their ideas are that the Chinese values are antithetical to America's strategic interests. And that this policy of engagement, which began with President Nixon back in 1972, has not really uh, served America's interests, but in fact has eroded US national security. The people who mostly wrote this letter, uh, if you look at the signatories, more than 100, are all retired um, Naval and Air Force uh, officers. Uh, so this is not the academic, this is the military community that is stating this. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, my, own con my own recommendations for this. Um, and I wanna thank Melissa for giving me a chance to go over my 40 minutes. Um, so the sensitive points for both China and US, what are the hot buttons for, for the Chinese? The issue of Taiwan is the hottest button. Um, in terms of documents, the US government has acknowledged that Taiwan is a part of China, yet it sells weapons, continues to sell weapons, um, has its, uh, some of its top leaders visit Taiwan and so on and so forth. So, um, and the US also sends uh, its military uh, in these various kinds of provocative forays into the South China Sea and so on and so forth. So military confrontation, containment, from the Chinese perspective. Uh, for the US, the hot buttons are probably China's imagined hope to become the world superpower, uh, the sole superpower, which is exaggerated. Xi Jinping offers a shared governance model with this new type of major power relationship. Um, but even uh, President Biden seems to sometimes articulate the idea that the Chinese seek this kind of global supremacy, which is really not the case. But this is this perception on the part and, and the words that are used by the US leadership. So that's the hot button. Somehow China's ambitions are too great. Um, future path, I think for me, the most important ones are peace and cooperation around the two issues that are really the most consequential for the world, as well as for the US and China. One is global warming, uh, the other is nuclear war. Uh, that's where you really need to engage. So far, people have engaged on issues like economic growth and tariffs and things like that, and the military confrontations in the South China Sea uh, and human rights. For me, the, the most important issues are global warming, which is an existential threat and China and the US have to work together. They're the two largest emitters of all of these greenhouse gases and they must work together. Uh, otherwise global warming will overwhelm everybody including us and so on, um, as well as the nuclear, uh, nuclear war. Recommendations, uh, get informed, stay informed. Uh, unfortunately, the, the current trend in in the uh, US, China from the US side is very negative. The Chinese have in some ways also reciprocated. Uh, so they're becoming much more assertive uh, in many areas, uh, in diplomacy as well as in the military. So get informed on these. Um, and my own recommendation is that our own government, our own leaders need to focus on what the US really needs, healthcare, uh, we need, instead of devoting $30 billion more to the military budget to challenge China in the next generation of weapons, we need that $30 billion for pandemic uh, booster shots for education uh, and so on. So we really need to inform our own elected representatives of what we want rather than have the agenda set by the elite policymakers in Washington, DC. So, uh, for me, that's the basis of democracy and informed and active citizenry. citizenry. So get involved and um, we, want our, we want our resources devoted to 
uh, overcoming uh, global warming, uh, negating nuclear war, and taking care of our health care and education. So that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you so much for listening.